Good afternoon again everybody and welcome to our holy hour here at St. Joseph's Catholic Church. Thank you for joining us as we are streaming this live on Facebook. As I get this blessed sacrament from the tabernacle, I invite all of you to join in our opening hymn. O Divine Jesus, lonely today in so many tabernacles, without visitor or worshipper, I offer you my poor but loving heart. 
despair of love for you. You are ever watching under the sacramental veils. In your love you never sleep and are never weary of your vigil for sinners. O oh, good Jesus, I love you. I am truly sorry for ever having offended you. O oh, lonely Jesus, may my heart be as a lamp, the light of which shall burn for you alone. Bless me, O oh, Jesus. Come spiritually into my soul and fill my heart with love for you. Make me completely yours. Take this sinful heart of mine and guide it through this veil of tears. Heart of Jesus, hear me. When I draw my parting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, then, sweet Jesus, be near me. Heart of Jesus, hear me. Watch, sacramental sentinel, watch for the weary world, for the erring soul, and for your poor lonely child. Protect us all from the coronavirus. Divine healer, give health to those who are ill. And as we spend some time in prayer this afternoon before the Blessed Sacrament, I wanted to read a brief reflection from Lady Julian of Norwich concerning prayer. Then the way we often pray came into my mind, and how, through lack of knowing and understanding of the ways of love, we pester him with petitions. Then I saw truly that it gives more praise to God and more delight if we pray steadfast in love, trusting his goodness, clinging to him by grace, than if we asked for everything our thoughts can name. All our petitions fall short of God and are too small to be worthy of him. And his goodness encompasses all that we can think to ask. The best prayer is to rest in the goodness of God, knowing that that goodness can reach right down to our lowest depths of need. The best prayer is to rest in the goodness of God. And let us rest in the goodness of God for a few moments.
this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday, or as many people may know it, Passion Sunday. Lent is drawing to a close, and I thought that for this afternoon's reflection, I would turn to Father Ronald Rollheiser and read two passages of his thoughts on the Passion of Jesus that we can reflect on. And the second one will be waiting for resurrection. The passion is the gift of Jesus' passivity. Passivity is something that all of us have to deal with this week as we are asked to limit our social contact, to stay at home, to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. To do that, we have to be passive. So let's look to Jesus as our example. We speak of one section of the Gospels, that which narrates Jesus' life from the Last Supper until his death and burial, as chronicling chronicling his passion. On Good Friday, the lector begins the Gospel reading with the words, The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Why do we call Jesus' suffering just before his death his passion? Generally, this is not properly understood. We tend to think that passion here refers to intense sufferings, as in passionate suffering. That is not wrong. But it misses a key point. Passion comes from the Latin passio, meaning passiveness, non-activity, absorbing something more than actively doing anything. The passion of Jesus refers to that time in his life where his meaning for us is not defined by what he was doing, but rather by what was being done to him. What is being said here? public life and ministry of Jesus can be divided into two distinct parts. Scholars estimate that Jesus spent about three years preaching and teaching before being put to death. For most of that time, in fact, for all of it except the last day, he was very much the doer, in command, the active one, teaching, healing, performing miracles, giving counsel, eating with sinners, debating with church authorities, and generally, by activities of every sort, inviting his contemporaries into the life of God. But he was busy. He is described at times as being so pressured by people that he didn't even have time to eat. For almost all of his public life, Jesus was actively doing something. However, from the moment he walks out of the Last Supper room and begins to pray in Gethsemane, all that activity stops. He is no longer the one who is doing things for others, but the one who is having things done to him. In the garden they arrest him, bind his hands, lead him to the high priest, then take him to Pilate. He is beaten, humiliated, stripped of his clothes, and eventually, this constitutes his passion, that time in his life and ministry where he ceases to be the doer and becomes the one who has things done to him. What is so remark remarkable about this is that our faith teaches us that we are saved more through Jesus' passion, his death and suffering, than through all of his activity of preaching and doing miracles. How does this work? Ten years ago, Father Rollheiser writes, his sister Helen, an Ursuline nun, died of cancer, a nun for more than 30 years. She much loved her vocation and was much loved within it. For most of those 30 years, she served as a den mother to hundreds of young women who attended an academy run by her order. She loved those young women and was for them a mother 
an older sister and a mentor. For the last 20 years of her life, after her own mother died, she also served in that same capacity for our family, organizing us and keeping us together. Through all those years, she was the active one, the, con the consummate doer, the one that others expected to take charge. She relished the role. She loved doing things for others. Nine months before she died, cancer struck her brutally, and she spent the last months of her life bedridden. Now things needed to be done for her and to her. Doctors, nurses, her sisters in community, and others took turns taking care of her. And like Jesus from the time of his arrest until the moment of his death, her body too was humiliated, led around by others, stripped, prodded, and stared at by curious passerbys. Indeed, like Jesus, she died thirsty with a sponge held to her lips by someone else. This was her passion. She, the one who had spent so many years doing things for others, now had to submit to having things done to her. But, and this is the point, like Jesus, she was able in that period of her life, when she was helpless and no longer in charge, to give life and meaning to others in a deeper way than she could when she was active and doing so many things for others. That's a great lesson in this, not the least of which is how we view the terminally ill, the severely handicapped, and the sick. There's a lesson too on how we might understand ourselves when we are ill, helpless, and in need of care from others. The cross teaches us that we, like Jesus, give as much to others in our passivities as in our activities. When we are no longer in charge, when we are beaten down by whatever, humiliated, suffering, and unable even to make ourselves understood by our loved ones, then we are undergoing our own passion. And like Jesus in his passion, we have in that the opportunity to give our love and ourselves to others in a very deep way.
The second reflection from Father Roald Heiser is called Waiting for the Resurrection. We live in difficult times. We've only to watch the news on any given evening. If there's an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving God who's Lord of this universe, his presence isn't very evident on the evening news. There's violence all over the planet, fueled on every side by self-righteous ideologies that sanction hatred, by self-interest that lets communities fend for themselves, and by a socially approved greed that lets the poor fend for themselves. It's fair and reflective to wonder, where is the resurrection in all of this? Why is God seemingly so inactive? Where is the vindication of Easter Sunday? These are important questions, even if they aren't particularly deep or new. They were the questions used to taunt Jesus on the cross. If you're the Son of God, come down off that cross. If you're God, prove it. Act now. Then and now, it seems, we've never figured out why salvation can't work like a normal movie, where at the end, a morally superior violence kills off all that's bad. Except God doesn't work like a Hollywood movie, and never has. For centuries, people prayed for a Messiah, a Superman, to come and display a power and a glory that would overpower evil. But what they got was a helpless baby lying in the straw. And when that baby grew up, they wanted him to overthrow the Roman Empire. Instead, he let himself be crucified. We haven't changed much in what we expect from our God. But God, as revealed in the death and resurrection of Jesus, doesn't meet our expectations even as he infinitely exceeds them. What the resurrection teaches is that God doesn't forcibly that he redeems the pain and vindicates the death. God rid the world of evil, not by using force to blot it out, but by vindicating what's good in the eyes of evil so that eventually the good is all that's left. Evil has to for forever look on the one whom they have pierced until it understands what it has done and lets itself be transformed. How does this work? What the resurrection of Jesus reveals is that there's a deep moral structure to the universe, that the contours of the universe are love and goodness and truth, and that this structure, anchored at its center by ultimate love and power, is non-negotiable. You live life its way, or it simply won't come out right. More importantly, the reverse is also true. If you respect the structure and live life its way, what's good and true and loving will eventually triumph, always, despite everything. If this is true, and it is, then we don't have to escape pain and death to achieve victory. We've only to remain faithful, good, and true inside of them. However, part of what's revealed here is that we need a great patience, a patience called hope. God's day will come, but God, it seems, is not in any hurry. Good and truth will always triumph, but this triumph must be waited for, not because God wants us to endure pain as some kind of test, but because God, unlike ourselves, doesn't use coercion or violence to achieve an aim. God uses only love, truth, beauty, and goodness. And God uses these by embedding them structurally and non-negotiably into the universe itself, like a giant moral immune system that eventually always brings the body back to health. God doesn't need to intervene like a superhero at the end, at the end of a Hollywood movie one who uses a morally superior violence to kill the bad people so that the good are spared pain and death. God lets the universe right itself the way a body does when it is attacked by a virus. The immune system eventually does its work, 
even if in the short term there is pain and infection, always in the end the universe rights itself. Simply put, whenever we do anything wrong, anything at all, it won't turn out right. It can. The structure of the universe won't receive it, and it comes back to us one way or the other. Conversely, whenever we do something right, anything that's true, good, loving, or beautiful, the universe vindicates that. It judges our every act, and its judgment allows no exceptions. Perhaps that judgment isn't immediate. It can seem a long time in coming, and thus, for a time, we can be confused and ask, why doesn't God, truth and goodness, come down off the cross? But eventually, always, and without a single exception, as Gandhi says, evil is shamed and good triumphs. The resurrection works. At this time, I'd like to invite you all to join in singing our hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Please respond after each invocation. I love you, O oh my God. God the Holy Spirit. I love, love you, O oh my God. Holy Trinity, one God. I love you, O oh my God. You who are infinite love. I love you, O oh my God. You who did first love me. I love you, O oh my God. You who asked me to love you. I love you, O oh my God. With all my heart. I love you, O oh my God. With all my soul. I love you, O oh my God. With all my mind. I love you, O oh my God. With all my strength. I love you, O oh my God. Above all possessions and honors. I love you, O oh my God. Above all pleasures and enjoyments. More than myself. I love you, O oh my God. More than anything belonging to me. I love you, O oh my God. More than all my relatives and friends. I love you, O oh my God. More than all people and angels. I love you, O oh my God. Above all created things in heaven and on earth. I love you, O oh my God. Only for yourself. I love you, O oh my God. Because you are the sovereign God. I love you, O oh my God. Because you are infinitely worthy of being loved. I love you, O oh my God. Even should you try me with trouble and misfortune. I love you, O oh my God. In wealth and in poverty. I love you, O oh my God. In prosperity and adversity. I love you, O oh my God. In health and in sickness. I love you, O oh my God. In time and in eternity. I love you, O oh my God. In union with that love with which the saints love you. I love you, O oh my God. In union with that love with which all the angels love you in heaven. I love you, O oh my God. In union with that love with which the Blessed Virgin loves you. I love you, O oh my God. In union with that love with which you love yourself eternally. I love you, O oh my God.
At times like this, we need hope. And of course, our hope is in God, our Creator, our Lord, Jesus Christ. A man of great hope was St. Paul. In his letter to the Ephesians, we see that hope, the hope he has for all of humanity and its future with God. And there we read, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bestowed on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavens. God chose us in him before the world began to be holy and blameless in his sight. He predestined us to be his adopted sons through Jesus Christ. Such was his will and pleasure that all might praise the glorious favor he has bestowed on us in his beloved. In him and through his blood we have been redeemed and our sins forgiven. So immeasurably generous is God's favor to us. God has given us the wisdom to understand fully the mystery, the plan he was pleased to decree in Christ a plan to be carried out in Christ in the fullness of time, to bring all things into one in him, in the heavens and on the earth. prayer in this time of the coronavirus. Generous God, fill us with compassion and concern for others, young and old, that we may look after one another in these challenging days. Bring healing to those who are sick with the virus and be with their families. 
May those who have died rest in your eternal embrace. Comfort their family and friends. Strengthen and protect all medical professionals caring for the sick and all who work in our medical facilities. Give wisdom to leaders in healthcare and governance that they may make the right decisions for the well-being of our people. We pray in gratitude to all those in our country who will continue to work in the days ahead in so many fields of life for the sake of us all. Bless them and keep them safe. O God of creation and life, we place ourselves in your protection. May the mantle of your peace enfold us this day and tomorrow. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. May all the saints of God pray for us. Amen. Please join us as we sing our hymn, Tantum Ergo.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Please join me as we pray the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Thank you all for joining us again today and remember that tomorrow morning we have mass again at 9 a.m. and our holy hour at 3 again in the afternoon. May you all stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow. Please join in our closing hymn.